fall, please and shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains would fall, please and shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will
every every praise that we give him everything we give him tonight you're not giving it to me you're not giving it to Victory Worship Center you're giving it to him I want you to think about that Hallelujah, I want you to think about that tonight. Any worth, any worth, you don't come to church and be faithful just to be faithful because you ain't got something else to do. But you just launch yourself. You build your life around Him. You don't build him around us he's the center of our lives and I want you to know that I want you to think about that I want you to think about every time you worship you're worshiping him you're giving it to him you're reminded of a of a grandpa and a son that went to church Passed the offering plate, and the grandpa just flipped a little nickel in. And on the way home, grandpa looked at the grandson. And he said, "Son, I didn't get much out of that service." The grandson said, "Papa, you didn't put much into it." So I'm not talking about your money tonight, but I'm talking about what you get out, what you leave here with is what you give because of what you put in. set up here and sing every song that Hadley knows and preach everything I have but if you're not willing to reach out and get a hold of it and do something with it you'll leave here empty every time isn't it good speaking of what you put in we're going to take up the offering while I'm on that note come on stand to your feet would you
will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Just slip your hands up, would you? you this, it's not near as hot on you as it is on me. So anyway, how many is glad to be in the house of God this evening? Amen. No place I would rather be. Hallelujah. I know there's a lot of people that's out of town. A lot of people just sitting home. But I'm glad to be where I am. Amen. Hallelujah. I appreciate you so much for being here, for being faithful, and giving me somebody to preach to. Amen. Because I feel the Lord has given me something. I preached it all the way to church this morning to Crystal. And I'm going to try to preach it to you now. But I want you to look with me at the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 14. 33, 14, Exodus. There is something here in this text that I've been pondering for several weeks. And just been kind of just meditating on all this. Because I really, at the time, I didn't really know which way or how it was going to come about. But as you look at this, Exodus 33 and verse 14, I'm thinking for a minute. If I want to start in 13 or 14, let's just do 14. And he said, My presence shall go with thee. I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If my presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee to show me your glory. I want you to think about that for a minute. Moses said, I want to see your glory. I want you to think about it tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We love you. We thank you and we praise you. Father, and I ask, Lord, that you would just speak to us and through us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You all are quiet. Hallelujah. Did you all get rest today? Mercy, Lord. Am I in the right place? In this Baptist church tonight? When you look at these verses and you look at this text, Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up. I'm going to read this to you in another version. It says, 
Then Moses said unto him, If your presence does not go up with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Now, I want you to think about that. What's going to separate the people? God's people from the rest of the world. That's what he's saying. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and you know, and I know you by name. And Moses said, now show me your glory. This is going to be good. Moses was keenly aware of the need for the divine guidance of God. Therefore, he said, if your presence does not go with us, don't send me. I want you to understand that. I want you to think about that. Church, if we as a church, if the people of God could get that kind of mentality that says, God, we're not going to open them doors unless you promise to meet us there, unless we know, God, that you're going to be in the midst of us, unless we know that you're going to show up and you're going to do something. Because let me tell you something. When you look at this, you see that God had called Moses to a greater place. He had called Moses up to Mount Sinai to spend time with God. Although he had already given him assurance that his presence would go with him, Moses is asking God for a confirmation. He said, show me your glory. What a request. See, Moses knew what it was like traveling without the presence of God. He had spent 40 years on the backside of the desert working for his father-in-law. Now think about this. There is no record, absolutely no record of God's presence with Moses during that time except Moses' destiny was not in Midian but in the people of God. And I believe this evening that there are far too many people tending sheep in the desert when God has a wonderful purpose and destiny for each and every one of us. Oh, my God. Listen to me. Tending sheep may pay bills. And it may afford you a living a place to live. But God's presence is the place that he has for your life. Now, you've got to think about this. All those years that I was, I was working uh, in the oil field and I was doing the things that I, I was trying to do to make a good living, I made a good living. Uh, but something within my heart kept tugging and kept pulling at me because uh, I remembered the glory that God had, he, had given me in my life uh, until he tugged at my heart, listen to me, reminding me of what he had called me for. Are you with me? Moses was no stranger to the glory of God. God had spoke to him from a burning bush. God had reminded him, take off your shoes. Standing on holy ground. God had enabled him to work, uh, to work through many miracles to lead Israel out of Egypt. As we read this morning, see Moses, he's seen what it was for God to pass the death angel to pass over by putting the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Untold amounts of gallons of water gushing out of the rocks. Are you with me? Manna and quail being provided. Egyptians killed. So we preach this morning, God's finger of fire on the tablets of stone. Man. Woo. 
Let me tell you something. What I'm trying to say is Moses had seen God do all these miracles. He had witnessed firsthand what God could do. But oh, let me tell you something that I was thinking about this week. But he wanted to see a son of God that he had never seen. I've seen the miracles, but he said, that's not good enough. God, I want to see your glory. I know you can bring water out of a rock. I know you can take the fiery finger and write up on tablets of stone. I know you can take care of the Egyptians, but oh God, I want to see your glory. Church, I'm going to tell you something about the glory. It's not something to be taken or talked about lightly. God led the people with a cloud by day. The cloud protected them from their enemies. What's this? And it protected them from the heat of the desert sun and gave them guidance. The cloud and the fire moves. Every time you look at it in the Old Testament, when the cloud would move, the people of God would go with it. He said the cloud by day and the fire by night. Oh, can you see it, church? Because let me tell you something. The cloud and the fires moves, but we've got to be ready to move with him. Don't you ever get too comfortable that when the cloud begins to move that you can't move with the cloud. Because let me tell you something. The fire by night lit the tent city, and it was great. Such a great illustration of God's glory. Just as Israel was led by God's glory. Can I preach right here for just a second? The church must also learn how to move when the cloud moves and stand still when the cloud is hovering over us. Oh, what is meant by the glory of God? Ephesians 3 and 16 tells us the glory belongs to God. Ephesians 1 17 tells us God is the Father of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 and 8 says that Jesus is the Lord of glory. Psalms 24, 7 and 8 reminds us that he is the, glo- he is the King of glory. Lift up your heads O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. A king, a king, let me say this, a king has the power to redeem. Jesus is called the king of glory because he alone has the power to redeem us from sins. We're going somewhere with this, so hang on. Glory belongs to God just as water belongs to the seas. You better understand what I said because in the Old Testament, they called it the Shekinah glory. Shekinah means manifested glory. It's the manifested glory. The Shekinah, listen, they saw the Shekinah cloud and the fire of God led them and they saw the Shekinah cloud as it filled the house of God as they dedicated the temple. Oh, let me tell you something. The manifest presence in that temple that told them they were God's people. That's what I just read you. The glory of God that Moses was talking about was the distinct separation from the rest of them and to Israel. It was the glory that caused them to be different. Can I tell you this? Church, it ain't how you dress that causes you to be different. It ain't how, it ain't the sign out there on that highway that causes the people of God to be different. Oh no, what it is, it's the glory that causes the people to be different. That's why, church, that it's an 
and absolute that we have the glory of God that we manifest that we see the glory manifested in our services and in our lives and in us that we don't rest that we put a mandate upon God and I'll never be satisfied until you show me until you show me I'll tell you something about this Well, everybody put a mandate on God. This stuff cost a price. That's why you see so many dried up churches, dried up Christians. Come on, somebody. Because they ain't willing to pay the price. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. We are only God's people because of the glory. On top of Mount Sinai, as Moses was called out by God, listen to me. Ezekiel saw the glory of God as the appearance of fire. Elijah prayed and the glory of God fell from heaven as fire. The upper room, glory, cloven tongues as a fire. Names used in the New Testament for the glory of God are brightness, brilliance, majesty, and splendor. Oh, we sing a song sometimes, and it's called, How Great Is Our God. Oh, if you ever just paid attention to the lyrics of that song, we sing the verses, the splendor of a king wrapped in royalty, and he wraps himself in light. How great is our God. Oh, let me tell you something about this. One day, one day we will know him in the fullness of his glory, for in his presence, the fullness of joy, and at the right hand, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let me tell you, in the days among Christian believers, Believers, one of the most commonly used words is glory. You know what it takes to have revival? It's going to take the manifested power of glory. The glory, the manifested power of God to sit down in this place. What do you think, church? A prayer meeting is one of the most important, most important services that a church body can have. And it's the least attended. Because everybody talks about the glory, but not everybody's willing to pay the price to get the glory. Come on, somebody. What if I told you that in order to see your family saved, that you might have to give more? It may cost you more. Oh, let me tell you, it will cost you more. It's going to cost us something as a church to see the glory manifested power of God because I'm going to tell you something. Church, here's the thing. We live in a world right now that prioritizing is all jacked up. Because we look at our services Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Let me ask you this. Is it that hard to try to get on a schedule where we think that everything in our lives, I'm not going to, listen to me, I'm not going to let, to let this thing pass me up, but I'm going to prioritize everything around God because let me tell you something, God is going to be the center of my life. Everything else can be around, but God, you're going to be the center. I don't care what I have to do to get here. I just want to be of the glory. I want to see you, God, delivering. I want you to heal the sick. I want to see something, God. 
I want to see the miracles. I want to see the signs and I want to see the wonders. Listen to me. Most of the time, we do not know exactly what the word glory means. Many times we talk about the glory of God and sometimes we say, listen to me, oh, the glory of God was there. The glory of God is being poured out. You understand that in Hebrew the word for God's glory is doxa, D-O-X-A, which means all that God is, all that God has, and all that God does. You realize that? So when God gives the glory, when God manifests his glory, it's all that God is, it's everything that God has, and it is all that God does. He's not holding anything back. It's everything. you got to understand this. I was talking to a pastor, a friend of mine, just yesterday because I, I, I was reminded, uh, uh, sitting and thinking about this yesterday, and, and, and I, I texted him because I wanted to hear the story again about the time that he was preaching at a church and he said he stood up behind the pulpit behind, he went in behind the worship team and he said there was just such a spirit that was hovering over that place and he said it was so thick he said literally he said it was almost physically like you could just cut it with a knife or just reach out and grab a hold of it he said it was like a dense fog like walking out in a dense fog and feeling the uh, moisture absolutely hitting you uh, and he said I got up uh, to step up behind the pulpit uh, and he said the very moment uh, that I stepped up behind that pulpit uh, he said I hit the ground uh, and he said it was an hour and 45 minutes uh, before I ever realized uh, what had happened he said I couldn't even raise my hand up Oh, you're looking at me like it's good, like I made this stuff up. Like, it, But let me tell you something. There is a place in God that we haven't even tapped into yet. Church, I want you to understand this because when the glory comes in, it can come in and can put you down on the ground. How do I know? First Sol uh, uh, Solomon says at Solomon's temple, uh, it talked about that it was so thick that when the priest went in, they couldn't even stand. Do you realize what I'm talking about? The glory. Moses said, I've seen your miracles. I've seen you bring water out of a rock. I've seen what you did to the Egyptians. But I want to see the glory. Church, when are we going to get to a place where our hearts cry is not anything else but God just give me your glory God it's not about let, let me tell you something it's not about praying for myself because let me tell you so many times we pray so selfishly it's all about us every time can you imagine listen to yourself sometimes when you pray it's all about you ever thought about when you call and you pray, when you change that prayer that it's not about you anymore that it's about God and says God I don't care about anything else all that will take care of itself if I can just have the glory you realize what it'll take what it takes, how many has been praying for lost family to be saved do you realize that if you'll get the glory in this house, that when people that don't even believe in God, they'll, 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 they'll come to a place when they walk up in here and they'll say, I didn't know that I didn't even believe in God, but when I walked up in this place, I felt something because let me tell you something, there's something about the glory of God and the manifested presence. Manifested presence. 
Why was it so important to Moses? But it seems to be the least important to the Western culture today. Why was it that Moses said, I'm not going anywhere if your presence don't go? Why was it that Moses said, God, I'm not going to do nothing. We're not going anywhere unless your presence goes with us. See, because let me tell you something. You, you look at this and you understand So many people today, they're saying, well, the church really needs to get relevant. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, because if you start doing all that stuff, it scares people. You do all that glory stuff, People get scared. Let's get relevant. Oh, yeah. Why is it that in the Bible I just read you a text that said it was the glory of God that separated the people of God from the rest of them? See, because let me tell you something, what has happened in the Western culture, and I don't have anything against this. Listen, I don't care because they want to put, they want to bring lights and fog machines because they want to replicate. They want to replicate what it was because let me tell you, why do they do that? Why does the, why has the enemy, why has the devil been so deceiving to let's bring fog machines in? You know why? Because on the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, go back and read it, there was a mist that come up off of it. So what better tactic? Listen to me. I don't care how much fog you got. You can have so much fog you can't see anybody next to you. But let me tell you something. Have the glory to go with it because the fog is nothing but a false advertisement of what God said is the real thing. See, because listen to me. Someone says, oh, the glory of God is here. We do not know what the fraction of that glory was manifested when you say the glory of God was in that place. Because you got to understand it may have been ankle deep. It could have been knee level. It could have even been waist level. And so on, but and 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 that's according to Ezekiel's uh, uh, vision. But listen to me. Back to what Moses was saying, and not to think that he was ungrateful, not to think that he was unthankful for anything that God had did. But in spite of seeing all those mighty works, Moses still cried out to God and say and said, I've seen all these things and you're good about what you do, but that's not going to satisfy me. I want to see you. I want to see your glory. I want to know who you really are. Listen to me. He said, I want to know your very nature. And God responded by saying, but you have found, I have found favor. And you have found favor in my eyes. And I'm going to do this for you. Think about that. After this, we know how God revealed himself to Moses on the mountain. And you look at Ezekiel or his Exodus 34, 6 and 7, and the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. When Moses asked God to show his glory, God revealed him his character. His nature. Do you know what the glory of God is? It is the very character of God. Look 
get tired of people saying, I don't want to go to church down there. I don't want to go to church over there. All that screaming and all that hollering and all that sweating. Shouldn't happen. I hadn't been in one in a long time, but have you, can you think about what happens in them clubs? They ain't quieting in them. They sweating, screaming, acting like fools too. But then they say, I can't go to church down there because all that screaming, all that hollering. Let me tell you something. Here's the thing about it. You know why they don't want to go down there? You got to get the glory. You get the glory in the house and they'll want to come. They'll want to be there. They'll want to go. You get the glory in the place and they'll show up. Get the glory in the place. God himself coming and revealing and manifesting himself. So God granted the desire of Moses and revealed his glory to him. Listen to me. We find right here that Moses, when I was looking at this, Moses was the only man under the old covenant who saw the manifestation of God's glory in the way that he seen it. find something exciting right here in my Bible because Moses had to struggle to reach such a position in God and then ask God, show me your glory. But in the new covenant age, in the age that we live in, well, listen to me, and I want you to understand that. We live in the old and the new testaments, but let me tell you, Jesus come, and he made it very simple, and Jesus said that anyone can see his glory, and the requirement was just to believe and to want it and to believe it. He made the past so simple to see the manifest presence of God, the mercy, the goodness, the long-suffering, and the power of God. And he said, only believe. Only believe and you shall what? See the glory of God. That is the full manifestation of who God is. You want to know who God is? God is the glory and he's the full manifestation of all that God has and all that God does. The glory is so important. In this in this, in this age, in this church age that we live in, it's the glory. In the church, we got to get back to a place of where the glory, the manifested power of God is moving in our midst and moving in our churches and moving in the people of God. It's so important in 1 Samuel chapter 4, Israel goes into battle against the Philistines and they pitched beside Ebenezer and then the Philistines posted up at Aphek. You got to understand this. That prior to the battle they had put the ark, it had been residing at Shiloh. They left it and they went to battle. The Philistines ended up killing 30,000 of their men. So when Israel said, let's go fetch that ark. Listen to me. They went to battle without the presence, the glory. Because let me tell you something about the, 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 how this ties in with the glory and the manifested power of God that bought the box made of acacia wood. I was looking at this earlier and it was three and three quarters feet long and two and a quarter feet wide and, 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 and it was layered with gold and it had Aaron's rod in it. It had a, a, a cup of manna and it had the two tablets. 
two poles on each side, the four carrying loops on each corner. And it had the two cherubs, cherubims on each side facing each other. Watch this. And it had the mercy seat in the middle. And then up from that mercy seat was the manifested presence of God. They had taken it to shallow and they'd rested it in shallow and they'd went out to battle. Now here they are and they got, they, 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 they've lost these men and now they begin to go back and they begin to try to pull the Ark of the Covenant back over to, the, to where they were. And let me tell you something. Here's what happened. They knew, the Philistines knew exactly when that Ark showed back up because they heard the people cheering and they heard it. But here's what the enemy said. The enemy said, oh, we've got to be careful now because the presence of God is back over there and we know what the presence of God, you can go read it later, the presence of God and we know what God did to the, uh, to the Egyptians on their behalf and so they knew by the yelling and the presence and the praises that God, the presence of God had showed back up Oh, you think the presence of God's not important, church? Let me tell you something. Without the presence, the devil will walk up in there and he'll chew you up and he'll spit you out. You can have church all day, sing everything you can from the front of that hymnal to the back and you'll never mount to nothing if you don't have the presence of God. Let me tell you something. Without the presence and the manifested power of God, we might as well turn the lights out, turn the lights out, move the pews, pull the carpet and start us a dance hall. Here they were. They had pulled the ark back in. Now Benjamin comes as a messenger and he goes to Eli first of all he tells the people of the town what happened the ark's gone the Philistines had done stolen the ark listen to me killed 30,000 people after they had went and got the ark, now the ark was stolen, and now it's gone, and now here comes Benjamin. He goes back, and he stops and tells the, the, the people in town, and they begin lamenting. They begin crying so loud that when he gets to Eli's, uh, Eli wants to know what's all this noise and racket about. Eli's 90, 94, 90, whatever, 92, 93, 5, something like that, years old, and the Bible says his eyes were dim. He couldn't see real good. And Eli, listen to me, now his two sons is dead. And I want you to understand as he stands, as he sits there, as this messenger comes, and he's telling, and, and Eli said, What's all this racket about? What's the noise going on? And he said, Eli, he said, Let me tell you, we've had some casualties in that battle and you've lost your two sons. But on top of that, all this, the crying and the, the, the noise you hear is because the ark of God has been taken. Eli did not ask about his daughter-in-laws. He didn't ask what they'd done with the corpse of his two sons. Eli's concern was where's the ark? Where's the glory? so devastating to him that his 94 or not whatever his body he flipped over backwards and broke his neck and he died so devastated not because his sons died but because the glory of God was taken it's gone the manifested presence so devastating Phineas' wife was in labor having a baby. Listen to me. She catches the news that the ark was gone. 
can. You've lost your husband, and we've lost the ark, and it was so devastating to her. It threw her in early labor, and she was having trouble uh, 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 bearing this child. Uh, and quickly, uh, as she was beginning to die, the midwife said, uh, quick, uh, it's a boy. What do you want to name it? What do you want to name it? She could have said Hophni Jr., Phineas Jr. She could have said anything. Uh, she could have said John or Luke, uh, or let's name it Eli. Let's name it. What? But no, no, no. In her dying breath, uh, she said, call that boy. Ichabod. Ichabod. Ichabod translates to the glory has departed. You know what's sad? Is you can either have in these days we've we've got one or two things happening in this world today. We've got a church that is after the spirit of Eli, or they're after the spirit of Ichabod. What am I saying? I'm saying there is some people that are having church. They're going through the motions, and the spirit of Ichabod is so much on them. They can put lights in and cameras and, 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 and fog machines. We may not have the glory. We may not go to prayer meeting. We may not do this. We may not do that. We may not have it all together. But let me tell you something. We'll imitate what we don't have. And then uh, let me tell you, that's why people's lives are not being changed because they have a spirit of Ichabod upon them. Oh, can I tell you what we need in this? last days uh, is we need a people that's going to rise up uh, and say I want the spirit of Eli I cannot live uh, without the glory can't live without the glory so devastating so devastating listen to me When I was thinking about that and I was reading those texts, I couldn't help but go back and read it. He wasn't concerned about his dead son's body. Just where's the glory? Oh, my God, church, when the glory of the Lord filled the temple, Seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Listen to me. When the glory of the Lord filled that all that house where they were sitting on the day of Pentecost, the people responded with praise, speaking wonderful works of God in unknown tongue. The song of the seraphim was a beautiful song of adoration unto God. But listen to me. But we have a song that they cannot sing, the song of the redeemed. Listen, God's glory always interrupts human plans. Always interrupts us interrupts our plans because let me tell you something here's what you got to understand when the temple was dedicated and the priest could not go in because the glory of the Lord had filled that house when the ark was brought into the temple the priest could not stand to minister John the revelator who had leaned upon the bosom of the Lord fell as dead at his feet when he saw the revelation of the majesty of God. God's glory always produces, what's this, a godly fear. You don't hear that. You don't hear that. I 
How many remember that? How many remember when people in America, whether they saved or unsaved, they had a fear of God? Even church folk don't have a fear of God anymore. When Isaiah saw God's glory, he said, I am a man of unclean lips. Simon Peter said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Job said, I've heard of thee, and I bore thee myself and repent. When the glory of God is present, sinners tremble. I mean that. Saints, saints stand in awe. Hearts are always, listen to me, always move to conviction. And the church stands in a holy reverence. You know what the biggest trouble in the world, in the church world today is? Do you know what the biggest trouble is? Let me tell you what it is. One of the troubles in the church today is the lack of the fear of God. of the fear of God. Listen to me. I want to tell you something. I want you, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Growing up as a kid, I can remember in the church, even when a message went out, everybody, Close their eyes. I can remember as a little kid. I was scared to even open my eye. I wouldn't even look around. Why? Because there was a holy reference. There was a holy reference. Church, I'm going to tell you something. There used to be such a reverence in the church house of God that we were told growing up, you better use the bathroom before you ever come to church. God forbid if it had been a day where we had iPhones. Our pastor would have said, here you go. Hey, I was raised up rough, I'm telling you. You don't believe me? I was telling somebody the other day. You know what kind of reverence I'm talking about? I'm talking about the reverence, the reverence kind of reverence that when I was acting up in the middle row in the old building, my pastor come got me. He grabbed me by the shoulder just like this, pulled me up by the shirt, and he said, young man, turn around, sit down, or I'm going to take you out and bust your hand in. You say, did your mama get mad? Nope, because it wouldn't have done no good because he didn't give a rip who got mad. You know what he said? And I'll tell you this, you get mad at me for that, I'll take you out, whip you too. Well, some of you would jerk your kids up, you'd leave and you'd never come back. I ain't had my kid treated like that. Then get that brat and take care of him. Make him sit down, shut up and mind and learn some respect up in this house. Reverence. Go home tonight, look up the definition of reverence. Because I won't tell you, we live in a world today, they don't understand reverence. They sure don't understand godly fear in the house of God. Because let me tell you something. Here's what you got to understand. 
you got to realize that church, there is something about this. There's something about the reverence because let me tell you something. Here's what happens. We are lacking fear today. Therefore, when you lack fear of God, you can't have the glory of God. It's time the church has a healthy fear of God again that moves them into a place of holiness. I have to get to my message now because here's what I want you to understand. God's glory inspires always. God's glory inspires holy living. Throughout the Bible, glory and holiness are mentioned always together, intertwined. Can't have one without the other. Exodus 29, 43, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified, made holy by my glory. God is glorified in, in the holiness of his people and true holiness always gives glory to him. When the glory of God is in the church, there will be holiness within the people. Come on, somebody. You cannot live in the presence of God without making a commitment to the holiness. God's glory produces Always, listen to me, God's glory always produces transformation. Transformation. God's glory changes you and it changes me. Listen, when Moses saw the burning bush in Midian, listen, he was, he was aware that it was the glory or the presence of God and that he was never the same after that. When the disciples saw the glory of God on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were never the same. When Jacob saw the glory of God with the angels ascending and descending from heaven on the ladder, listen, it changed his whole life. He was never the same. I pray. Pray that God show us your glory. Would you stand with me real quick, please? Transform us. Never let us be the same. Listen to me. That drug addict don't have to walk up in his house and then walk out and while he's out in the parking lot, after he leaves the service and do the same thing he did before he walked in here. Ah, come on, somebody. Because when he walks in, he finds the glory up in this place. And God's glory will help us recapture the vitality of Pentecost and move people from formalism to freedom in the spirit. Open the eyes, open our eyes to the splendor and the majesty of him. One more time, God, I want you to lift your hands all over this room right now and I want you to begin to pray now. God, we want your glory manifested in our lives. Come on, church. Come on. Come on. Come on. Moses said, I've seen your miracles. I want to see the glory. Come on, church. Is there anybody in this room right now that would say, I want to see your glory, God. 
I want to see your glory, God. I want to see your glory. I want to see your manifested presence of God in our church, in my life, in everything I do. When I walk in the office tomorrow, I want the manifested presence, the glory of God to be upon my life. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be in the same mundane religion that I've always been in. But God, I want to see the glory of God. I see the glory. I see the glory. I want to see the glory. I want to see the glory. I want to see the glory. Oh, is there anybody in this room right now that would come into agreement with?
So walk in the room.
so walk in the room